So, David, um, the filmmaker behind it, Sicilian Dream, thank you very much for joining us in Nice. It's a pleasure. Congratulations with your nominations. Um, it's really always the same question, the background story, just how you became involved in this. It's because it's not a documentary and it's not a, a work of fiction, it's like um, uh, a hybrid almost. Is that the, the right it's way to describe it? It's a hybrid of a theatrical um, yeah, film and also it's a story as well. It's a history. And there was two stimuluses really. One obviously is my passion for old cars, yeah. which I've had ever since I was 18. We should point out you dr you've actually driven to Nice in one of these. I will do. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. I, I mean, I've, I've driven old cars since I was a student. I was almost a car trader at university. I used to buy Austin 7s for five and sell them for 10 pound to finance my beer. Uh, and I've carried on ever since. And gradually I've learned the skills to restore them and uh, I've always financed it by selling one and, and buying another pile of bits and building them up. So many are restorations. The Crossley I've just driven from England in, and it took us three and a half days in a 1923 vintage car, uh, was actually restored. Uh, it was a, it's a beautiful car and a lovely touring car, and I always wanted to do a big European trip in it, which we've done now. But for the film, I was lucky enough in early 2000 to buy a Nazaro racing car from a museum in uh, Turin through some friends about, who knew about it and it is a very rare car and in fact there are only two left in the world. Nazaro was a, a very famous Grand Prix driver in his day before the First World War. He right. won everything uh, and his contemporary which everyone knows about is Lancia. The Lancia car survives but the Nazaro car faded out in 1923 I think. But the pre-war cars were very robust, very solid, and he actually entered the Targa Floria race, which had by this time, in 1913, was right round the island, and this is described in the film. Yes. Um, it, so it was a very long race, and Nazaro won it in a car. It wasn't the same car as mine, but the sister car, mm. and the original car has disappeared now. So, and, and the one in Australia, which is the other one, really doesn't look right. It's all painted white like Australians do. So mine is the most original looking and the most unrestored as well. Right. Uh, it's still got the original paint on it. And uh, I have driven it probably on the road, nearly 30,000 road miles wow. since I bought it. And I've never had the engine to bits. I've never taken the sump off it. I've renewed the clutch and I renewed the exhaust valves and that's all I've done in 30,000 miles. It's unbelievably reliable. It's got um, no electrics, it's got acetylene gas lamps, <laughs> uh, so driving at night is quite hazardous and um, you start it on the handle and I'm getting a bit old for cranking it but mm. I can still start it <laughs> and it just goes and goes all day. So that was the first connection. Um, I was lucky enough to get invited in oh, 2006 to the centenary of the of the original Grand um, Targa Floria race, which was in 1906, and there was only a couple of us in it from England. But um, luckily, they gave me the prize for the uh, Targa Floria winner of that class, and it was in. There were all cars in it, Ferraris, Porsches, the whole lot, all going round this circuit. And of course the big worry was uh, they would catch us up. But what they did is they stopped the race once a lap to let us catch up. Oh right, brilliant. So, so in fact uh, we never stopped racing. They did, they had ice creams and that while we caught up. And be to comply with modern health and safety regulations, all the stuff that stopped the racing back in, in 77, um, they, they made everyone go through the villages at the proper speed. Right. And so all the villagers were waving, and it was a grand day out, it was lovely. But uh, you still felt you were racing because you could go as fast as you want between the villagers. <laughs> so that, that gave me the idea. I knew my car was going to be 100 years old in, in um, 2013. I thought, somehow I'm, I've got to celebrate it. And the idea started f for men that I should um, maybe make a film of just about the car, bring some of my friends down, because I've got a lot of friends with old Edwardian motor cars, and we'd make, put a film together. Of course, it's just escalated like Topsy since then. It's no longer an amateur camcorder film. It's a full-blown documentary. Uh, you just get caught up with it. The other real connection, which 
is important in my mind is um, there's a very famous film called Il Gattapado, The Leopard. It is a classic Italian book and they made a film about it with, of all people, Burt Lancaster really? playing the part of the, of the original aristocracy in Sicily and they dubbed him brilliantly. He didn't, he, it sounded like him, but it was all dubbed. And he just looked the part. And the whole point of that film, it was the, the demise of the ruling classes in, in, Italy, in Sicily. Mm. And the Garibaldi invasion came towards the end of that century. And there was a total revolution. And it was a popular revolution. Everyone was overjoyed. And it allowed the new entrepreneurs to flourish which they'd been held down before. And the most important one was the Floria dynasty. Uh, they were the, became the richest. They, they had shipping and fishing and minerals. And uh, they probably made most of the boats that took the mafia to, to America, I would think. Um, and the young Vincenzo Floria, he, was, he didn't have to work because his, his, uh, the family were rich and he could buy a, any car he, he really wanted. So as the new cars came out at the turn of the century, he just kept buying them. And that's how he met Nazaro, Felici Nazaro, because Felici worked for um, Fiat. And he brought, he delivered a car, and you can see in the film how they, they actually hit it off. And um, Florio asked him to stay as his mechanic and, and playmate, really. And he stayed for four years. And it was during that time they cooked up the idea of the race. And they didn't really have any proper roads then, they were just mule tracks. But, um, so all, all the early races were actually just on gravel. So that's how it started. And I saw our film in some ways as being a con continuation of the story of the leopard because the leopard describes everything up to, up to the yeah, turn yes. of the century and how the, the, the whole social order got upset and then of course the new the new order was the entrepreneurs and to crown it all of course the Florio family although they succeeded they overspent their means and in fact they were destitute at the end and that was a rise and fall story so that to me made a very interesting uh, niche to the story not just about motor racing but how all empires rise and fall so that essentially were the two stimuli which got me to make the film and the fact it became a, a full-blown documentary was I started talking to people about uh, I needed help I wanted some, I needed a cameraman yeah, and I needed yeah. a director yeah. and just by chance one of my sons played seven aside with a very very important cameraman who's done a lot of Top Gear work, Dave, Dave Meadows who was the principal um, uh, photographer in the film and he knew a director called Phil Walsh, unfortunately he can't be here this, this week, um, I met Phil and Phil was one of the first people, and I talked to lots and lots of people, who actually grasped the story and came out with ideas that appealed to me. And I thought, here's someone it's, who actually yeah. can illustrate my idea. That I got the idea, I got, all the, I got all the cars to do it, but I wanted a story. And I'd already got the story in the book I'd, I'd written about the Belle Epoque, which was taken from... A, uh, the author was um, Bradley. He published a book, uh, oh, I think, over 50 years ago, and it is the definitive story of the Targa Floria races up to the time he died, and it's in English. He was editor of Motorsport before Bill Body. So um, it's a wonderful book. Uh, description and a lot of the little vignette scenes we have in it came out of his book right. because um, obviously we couldn't imagine those but as far as we know there were real things that happened in the life of, of young Vin Vincenzo Florio and then oh lots of what people wanted to help we got friends come in help with the makeup with the costumes uh, help run taxis and run people around so it was a homemade affair in many respects but it still seemed to cost a lot of money we did it in, in two parts, really. The first part was we made a trailer, and it took 10 days shooting, and we, we financed that. Uh, with Just a, for the trailer? The trailer. We, Just for the trailer? It took 10 days uh, shooting, and most of the theatrical work was done in that 10 days. Right. And we managed to recruit uh, many of the Italian people in that 10 days. Uh, and they were just delighted to do it. It's in their blood. They just wanted to be part of it. Mm. And you can see in the film, that it, it, it's a passion. And that's where the passion comes from in the title. Uh, it, it has probably made Sicily hang together since the turn of the century, really. That, that every year they had this race, they were looking forward to it. And it was shut down, as again, as we show in the film, because there was a fatal accident. Yes, and it's yeah. one too many. 
and uh, at that point it carried on as a rally but um, the rally just didn't have the same significance as a race and they would still get people getting killed in the rally <laughs> <laughs> and this year actually it, it's not the centenary it is the hundredth edition it's on actually now um, and that's because in the war years they didn't run it so it, it's, it's the hundredth one they've run so anything for a celebration with the Sicilians a, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I should have been down there, but I'm here instead. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just carry on? But I suppose it would have been been and gone by then. <laughs> yeah. So you you put this trailer together, <clears throat> um, and I wrote the book to yeah. help raise money for the next step. And the next step is when we uh, we went down for 30 days then shooting with a, with a crew not big by many standards, but we had 11 in the crew then. And then we took down uh, 15 of these 100-year-old racing cars, and they're all mates of mine. They were great. They, they, they lent the cars just for a holiday. Uh, I paid their expenses to go there in the hotel, and I shipped the cars down. And what was also interesting, the Alfa Romeo of, um, of Alan de Cadney uh, is a very um, famous car too. There were two cars down for the Targa Florida in 30 or 31 which Nubilari drove and they're never sure which one he drove but it could have been Alan's and uh, it's a fantastic car and he did actually let me drive it. <laughs> he did? <laughs> yes. And, and how did you, was, uh, was Alan, I know you've alluded to having friends, was at that time Alan already a friend? No, well the initial, the initial um, sortie was to get Francesco because having thought about it and seen Francesco's work on the BBC yeah, about Italy driving his Alfa Romeo yeah. all the way down. I thought, he has to be the man. How do I get him? Um, so we just phoned him up. <laughs> well, literally, someone said, oh, yeah, 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 well, we want to make a film about the Targa Florida. Are, are you interested in, in being involved? Yeah, come and see me, come and see me. So we went over to Venice, met him, and he opened his door of the palace. His hands were black with oil. I thought, here's a man after my own heart. Well, literally, turn and there's a wolf. Yeah, no, he said, I'm just fixing the boat. Because <laughs> they go by everywhere by boats there. Yeah, of course, yeah. And you saw some pictures of his study in the film that was just, I mean, it is a shambles, total shambles, just like my, my study. Uh, he won't let the cleaners go in. He says, I know where everything is. He straight away got the Prosecco out, and we were oh, we had a yeah, couple of bottles good. of that. We talked about the idea. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I said, well, let's go to lunch. He's, Oh, I've got, got an appointment with my wife. One moment, let, we went, she went out and she said, that's all right, we've solved that, let's go to lunch. <laughs> and we made the deal just over lunch, just on another bottle. <laughs> Brilliant, so you got him. And we got him, but at that point, um, I used him in my marketing to try to pull the BBC, try, because he's a, essentially a BBC man, yeah. and they were dithering and dathering, and in the end, Rather than make a TV production, which would have been about 55 minutes, we elected to go for a theatrical release, which mm. has to be over the hour. And the key thing about that is that once you have a theatrical release, you can become eligible for um, a, a tax credit. Tax credit, yeah, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> what's fascinating is uh, it was for British films. Right. And here we are, we make a film in Sicily. But because of a, a European Union diktat, films made within the EU are, are deemed to be British. <laughs> we qualified for the tax break. What a is, brilliant thing, though. Yeah, that was the one good thing in my life the EU's ever done. <laughs> but I had then to become the production company, because what I didn't wish to do was to pay a production company uh, to make the film for me and then, to, then get the credit. Mm. So I... I, I I went through all the routine with the British Film Institute, we passed, and it really essentially meant that my company had to do everything, every bottle of water, every bill to be paid, we just did everything, and the, uh, the, the production company supplied the director uh, and the assistant director, yeah. no, the assistant director I hired directly, uh, and um, I say the cameraman I, I, I hired, and I, I did everything in the end, uh, never has so much been done by one person. <laughs> was it was it very strong? I mean, I, I, I speak to filmmakers all the time, yeah. but I can imagine was it sleepless nights. Yeah, I slept. I'm sleeping less now because we have to, we're trying to sell it now and get the money back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that that was the bit I never thought about. The whole idea. It was fabulous fun making it, being down there, chasing around the circuit with the lads in the cars and that. 
and uh, we thought, gosh, once it's finished, you know, I'm going to do something else for a living. It's not true. <laughs> no, because then, like you say, you've got to sell it. Yeah, I'm going around festivals and pushing DVDs and uh, so forth. So. Do you, think, um, do you think if you'd have, I mean you obviously made a conscious decision to have it there, the reason for all sorts of reasons, you want it to be a proper story, you didn't want it to be compressed, but do you think had you discussed it and thought okay we can do this in 55 minutes, I know you didn't want to, do you think there would have been a, a likelihood of the BBC picking it up? I can't speak out of turn but it's actually on their table at the moment. Uh, what we're trying to achieve is they're looking for complementary stories to go with the new Top Gear, either before ah. or afterwards. They've got the audience and they want to keep the audience and uh, I just, I don't know, you never know what's happening with the BBC but we're hoping they may, they may show it alongside Top Gear on one of their, their programmes in this next series. Um, we've got an Italian distributor who feels confident they'll get it on Italian TV and I'm obviously looking for global markets. America is the biggest market for hits on my website. Right. Um, by a long way, more than, more than Britain and far more than Italy, believe it or not. That's surprising. But, well, it's probably not. There are a lot of Italians in America. Ah, right. And it's a bit of homeland to them. But it, many from Sicily, I'm sure. Yeah, and yeah. they can see this as part of their heritage. Um, and that's, I've entered some uh, American film festivals um, to try to get my foot in the door there. The DVD sales are going there, but I, I just wanted to get it more widespread. Uh, I've entered it for the Indianapolis um, Film Festival, which is an interesting one, because that was the home of American racing about the same period. Mm. So if they don't accept it, uh, I'm not sure who will. Uh, it's in, in California. And then the other one I'm going for is um, in Japan, because it, there's a massive audience in Japan. If you can get entered in one of their um, festivals, they will do the translation for you. Really? And they will dub it, yes. And then they do, Sony, I believe Sony sponsor it, and they do it for, as long as you use Sony um, uh, audio and things like that, they, they, they do it for free. And that's, a, oh right, so it's, one, it's a free service, so it's just add on. If you get accepted. Yeah, yes. yeah, of course. Yes. And so that, that immediately opens up at a Japanese market for DVDs then, which is what, what, what I'm hoping for. The DVD sales are going okay. They make far more money than the cinema. The cinema is just hard work. As long as I push it and, and call people and ring up, say it's on, we can fill the house. But uh, the moment I don't start doing that, then nothing happens. Um, it, it's trying to get someone who will actually pick it up and run with it, which I haven't actually found yet. But that's the reason come to festivals, is to get, is to increase awareness. Yeah, of it. yeah. Um, and, and so uh, it's ready to go and then Alan, how, how did that come about? Oh, Alan de Cadney was another find, really. I was, I was looking for um, a complementary um, personality to go with Francesco. I didn't really want Francesco talking like David Attenborough to the camera. You know, Attenborough, really. Because I've, I've seen him and he's a brilliant presenter. Oh, he's fabulous. But I, I, I really thought, I, I like the idea which comes from Top Gear, although I don't really like Top Gear, of them talking to each other, not mm. to the audience. Yeah. And that's where I, I, I came up with the idea of Alan de Cadney because I knew of him, I knew he was interested in old cars. And again, he was quite difficult to get hold of. Uh, he was ex-directory, but I got friends with the British Racing Drivers Club, of which he's a member. Um, they wouldn't give me his phone number. They said, we'll phone him for you yeah, yeah. Uh, and see if he's in. And he called me back and said, come and talk to me. And it, it, it was easy. I love it. love the idea. It's, it's, it's time someone did like that. This, And he was great. Absolutely great. And can uh, you tell He never met Francesco before. You, really? No, but they hit it off. Thank goodness. They, they met actually on location. What, the first time there was hit, First yeah. time they met was on location. And would you mind telling us about Alain's actual racing history himself? Because he's got quite an interesting story, hasn't he? Well, he, yeah. He, well, the, some of the stories in the film, he, he, he actually built his own prototype Lola cars. Yeah. And some of the shooting was actually in his workshop where, where he built them. Yeah. He doesn't do that anymore. And he took on the big factory teams uh, as an independent and quite often won. He won at Monza and Silverstone in his Lola. Yeah. And then, of course, he had his mega crash in the Targa Florio. But he's got a big collection of, of cars and, and motorbikes, too. He's very much into, into motorbikes and Spitfires. As, really? <laughs> oh, yes. He, he, I don't know whether he owns it, but he, he certainly claims to have a Spitfire. <laughs> right, it's one of the few left. 
there's quite more than you think. Yeah, there, I know there is. There are, yes. I, I know there was. I saw. A pro, I'm going to go very no. quickly off PC. I saw a program how they restore, and I know it's just the amount of money required and the the technical expertise. Pin, pinning pinning Alan down is very hard. He's forever going to Goodwood and things like that, and he. He's also um, done a series, uh, Victory by Design, of American films, all about lovely cars like Aston Martins. And he hosts uh, a channel over there Does about it? motoring, yes. Uh, and he reports on, on Goodwood and, and other events that it's him to. And he has a big client with Credit Suisse. Uh, they sponsor him to do quite a lot of their, their events for them. Because they, they, they're heavy into, into motoring Credit Suisse. So it, it was very successful that because, uh, um, well, my opinion is they, they, they were a nice duo. They were total contrast in mm -hmm. character and background. We, we got the historian uh, on one side and we got the motor racing petrol head on the other. Uh, but they, they found a lot in common. In fact, Francesco's background is he was an architect. Yes, I know, because yeah. I've seen a lot of his programs. Yeah, he was an architect and he was apparently a very good one because he was winning competitions but he found the the graft in Venice just impossible he thought he'd won and somebody else would offer more money and then uh, he, he lost it and he said I've had enough of that and he, he just I think it was Maggie Smith got him into filming really I believe so he had the story yes uh, and um, that's when he made his first film about Venice and then that was followed by Top to Toe in his Alfa Romeo. Which is the one I've seen. Fantastic. Yeah, and then he, he had a, a wooden, uh, old wooden boat which he sailed from Venice to Istanbul in. That was a marvellous... Uh, you used to watch it. Oh, I haven't seen that. I've seen, yeah, the, the yeah, Top to Toe one. That good. was fascinating. And his, his last one, as far as I know, was um, about the Italian Shakespeare series. Right. I think there was a lot of tongue-in-cheek in it, actually, but um, I enjoyed it. And he does cookery, too cookery books. It's very multi-talented. So looking back, I know, I'm sure it's great fun making, it, it comes across in a film of course, yeah. um, but in hindsight, I know you hadn't been involved in filmmaking before, so it, you were a newbie really to it. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> yeah, and look at it like, my God, that was a lot more difficult than I thought. Was it a case of, I knew it was going to be tough and it wasn't too bad, or was it a lot better? How was the whole experience? The, the filmmaking side I was, uh, I was happy to, to pick up and learn. I got some good people around me. The, the, the hardest problem always is raising the money. That, that was, and probably half of the four years we spent was actually on money raising exercise. But I spent all my life in the oil business mm. raising money, so I was familiar with quite a lot of the channels. <laughs> but I did, t I tapped my friends and family quite heavily. <laughs> what to help with the, the funding? With the initial investment, yes, the initial investment. Uh, but that was again. It was uh, very good. The government have this scheme for startup enterprises where the investors um, can get half of their investment back in the first year against their income tax. So it became a interesting exercise because people got involved with it. Many of them came down to Sicily with with us um, and in, enjoyed the whole exercise. So uh, I, I think everyone likes a tax break in this world. Of course they do. Yeah. But that's what's been good about the British government. They, they certainly have helped the British film industry. Uh, um, um, it was abused quite heavily, but unfortunately by certain footballers and things, a lot, mm -hmm. lot of the schemes. Yeah. And they've clamped down a lot and, and made it much tighter. But we had no trouble getting approved because they could see we weren't... Uh, money laundering or anything like Yeah, it was the real deal, obviously, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were trying to just find money, not, not offload it. And what, is there something that you would do now? I mean, is there a next project? Can you follow this up? Do you want to follow this up? I don't really say it definitively. Obviously, I'm, I'm still in the, the mode of trying to get this one to re repay its investment, but we have a lot of footage taken. It's always a shame what finished on the cutting room floor. Yes, I know. I mean, we had GoPros on all those um, Edwardian cars. We had GoPros on the helicopters up there. The, f the amount of footage we got, which would easily make another film, not necessarily with the historical story, but for petrol heads. Yeah. You know, and uh, many of my friends said, we want more motor cars. <laughs> so the idea is if, if and when the DVD sales tail off, we will we'll put that together and, and put another disc in the package mm. which hopefully will re revive DVD sales which I hope will go on forever. <laughs> David Brennan, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, that was wonderful. Sicily is a world apart. 
a place like no other. O meglio lo racconta ai ragazzi, non ci credono. The race in the clouds. È troppo pericoloso. Fine della discussione. The Targa Florio was the first road circuit race of its kind. The most grueling test of man and machine. Un'idea pazza, completamente pazza. fast and dangerous and beautiful all in one go. It stirred emotions like never before. Tutta la mia vita era colma di una passione, muovendomi dal passato per vedere nel futuro. the most influential event in Sicily and the motor racing world.